and welcome to this new episode of Corky Buzz. What should we do when we have patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction that's less than 30 or less than 40? Of course, after we give them the guideline directed medical therapy. After they're taking saccharide levlaxarfan, SGLT2 inhibitor, beta blocker, and MRE or other therapies. Should we search for coronary disease in these patients, hidden disease? Or if they have previous history of coronary disease, should we revascularize them? Would that make a difference in the natural history of patients with chronic heart failure? These patients are usually difficult to treat and they have lots of comorbidities. Take for example this lady who is 60 plus with long-standing diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, and she is accidentally discovered to have an ejection fraction of 30 and she has vague complaints. She is already on medical treatment. Coronary CT scan shows a severe stenosis in the coronaries. So should we treat her by angioplasty or bypass? Would that make a difference? Or this 61-year-old gentleman with long history of coronary disease who stands everywhere, his ejection fraction is 25, he's already on good medical therapy, and this is his coronary angiogram. He has also vague symptoms, and his stress echo is non-conclusive. He has left main disease and severe distal disease. So should we refer him for bypass? Would that make a difference? Should we do angioplasty? Would that make a difference? So today we'll be talking about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or mildly reduced ejection fraction and coronary disease. We'll not be discussing acute coronary syndromes, cardiogenic shock complicating acute myocardial infarction. We'll be talking about ischemic cardiomyopathy. Those patients with heart failure have a previous history of myocardial infarction, previous revascularization PCR or, or bypass, or they have a significant stenosis of epicardial coronaries, coronaries proximal LED or left lane disease. We know that these patients with an ischemic etiology of heart failure, they have a poorer prognosis compared to heart failure without underlying ischemia. We know that from a retrospective study of more than 1,900 patients, we also know that the extent of the disease correlates with a poor outcome. Patients with two or three vessel disease, they tend to fare worse compared to patients without coronary disease or with a single vessel disease. And by revascularization, we hope that we can improve the ejection fraction reverse the heart failure symptoms, minimize hospitalizations, and improve their survival and prevent myocardial infarction. But the problem here is that in many situations, these patients have a prohibitive risk. The poor ejection fraction on its own can be intimidating. These patients may not come out of coronary bypass. Graft failure would be catastrophic. There is a risk of stroke. If they go for PCI, the risks are not trivial. Distal embolization can be drastic. South branch occlusion can be fatal. Stent thrombosis can also be catastrophic. And to add more to the complexity, these patients have usually atypical symptoms, as we saw in our two patients. They might have chronic elevations of proponin. Non-invasive tests might have limited accuracy, keeping in mind that patients with ejection fraction less than 30 were usually excluded from the big trials of stable coronary disease like the ischemia trial and the Courage trial. And the endpoints that we look for in heart failure, which are hospitalization, mortality, ejection fraction, functional class, are different from those endpoints that we look for in coronary disease, like myocardial infarction, stroke, and repeat revascularization. So in this episode, we'll try to provide answers for three questions. Should we revascularize patients with chronic heart failure and ischemic cardiomyopathy? Second question, should we assess viability before referring them for revascularization? And the third question, should revascularization be a surgical or a percutaneous revascularization? Welcome to Cardio Buzz, your one-stop shop for all things cardiology. We bring you the latest updates on heart health, including the most recent guidelines. We interview the experts and try to answer the difficult clinical questions of everyday practice. Should we revascularize ischemic cardiomyopathy? We'll try to find the answer from the three biggest trials that looked into this question, the stitch, the revive, and the ischemia. Start by the STITCH, which is probably the most important trial in this regard. It randomized more than 1,000 patients with an ejection fraction less than 30, 35, to medical therapy alone, or to medical therapy and coronary bypass grafts. And the study found that bypass graft resulted in reduction in all-cause mortality. Looking at the entire cohort, the reduction was not significant, probably because of the crossover. 17% of patients crossed over from optimal medical therapy into bypass graft. But if we extend it further to six years, and we look at cardiovascular death, we see a 19% reduction in cardiovascular death. And if we add to that hospitalization for cardiovascular causes, we get a significant 26% reduction in cardiovascular outcomes. And mind you that this is a benefit that we don't usually see even in the best guideline-directed medical therapies for heart failure. Of course, this comes at a cost. 
the chances of dying are more than three times in patients who go for bypass versus medical therapy. But of course, on the long term, these hazards are recouped by a 40% reduction in death from any cause or revascularization. Which patients benefit the most? And the golden rule here is that the sicker patients benefit the most. So patients with three vessel disease, injection fraction less than 27%, with an NV and systolic volume index of more than 79 have two or more of these prognostic factors, then they derive significant benefit from bypass. If patients have one or none of these prognostic factors, then they will not usually derive benefit from surgical revascularization. Does the presence of severe MR impact that benefit? The answer is yes. In those patients with concomitant severe mitral regurgitation, bypass alone did not change the outcome. It had to be combined with mitral valve repair or replacement. If we follow up these patients for a longer period of time, we see magnificent results. We see 16% reduction of all-cause mortality, 21% reduction of cardiovascular mortality. If we combine death from any cause or hospitalization, we see a 28% reduction in the outcome. And this is a marvelous benefit. So do we get the same benefits from percutaneous revascularization? The biggest trial that tried to answer that question is the REVIVE trial. That was a trial of PCI in patients with poor ejection fraction less than 35 seasoned operators with very high experience, and all patients had four or more viable myocardial syndrome. Unfortunately, revascularization by PCI did not improve or cause mortality or heart failure hospitalizations. Did it improve the ejection fraction? Sadly, no. Did it improve the quality of life? Again, marginal improvement that is not statistically significant. So why didn't we see the benefit with PCI? We saw it only with bypass. There may be several points to explain that. Could be the crossover. Two thirds of the patients were asymptomatic. Viability assessment was mandatory, but coronary physiology assessment was not routine and viability did not always correspond to the treated vessel. Spontaneous myocardial infarctions were less with coronary angioplasty and the follow-up was shorter than the stitch trial. The third trial is the ischemia, and we know that the ischemia trial was one of those landmark trials that taught us that an initial invasive approach didn't do much to patients with stable ischemic heart disease compared to an initial conservative approach. The study was a huge trial, more than 4,700 patients, and there was a small subset of patients who had a history of heart failure or LV dysfunction, less than 10% of the trial population. In that small population, there was a significant benefit from going for an invasive approach in patients with history of heart failure. Keep in mind that this result was driven in large by a small proportion of patients who had a reduced ejection fraction with little evidence of an effect in patients with heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction or mildly reduced ejection fraction. So the first question, should we revascularize? Probably the answer is yes and bypass. Should we test for viability or scarring and then refer only those with viable myocardium and keep patients with scarred myocardium for medical therapy? If we look at the subgroups from the STITCH trial, the REVIVE, and from other trials, management that is non adherent to viability assessment was similar to management that is adherent to viability assessment. I would like to take a closer look at another study, which is the POWER2 study. They randomized 430 patients to be treated based on the results of a viability assessment by positron emission tomography by PET versus the standard of care. And there are two main findings. There was no difference in the survival between the arm that did positron emission tomography versus the standard arm. But keep in mind that more than one quarter of patients who were tested for viability and had high or medium viability didn't go revascularization. And that shows you that viability as a theoretical concept is appealing, but to apply the results clinically is more difficult. So many of these patients who had significant viability did not have revascularization. If we look at those who were treated with the standard clinical practice and those who had viability assessment and adhered to the results of the viability, we see significant improvement in the outcome. So if we try to answer the question, should you go for viability or not, I would be inclined to Yes, go for viability assessment and try to adhere to the results of the viability assessment. Should we test for inducible ischemia? The answer is probably no. It's a funny answer, I know, but that's what we get from the data. That's the stage trial comparing those who had inducible ischemia by nuclear testing or by dobutamine echo. There was no difference compared to those who didn't have inducible ischemia. So the question of going by inducible ischemia, probably the answer is no. Should we do PCI or bypass? You probably got a hint on the answer when you compared the results of the STITCH trial 
with a revive track. But let's look at the guidelines. The guidelines made it clear if you want to improve the survival and stable ischemic heart disease, it's only cabbage for multivessel coronary disease. Of course, who are appropriate for CAM. If the ejection fraction is less than 25. Ejection fraction between 35 and 50, still there is a benefit from bypass, but of course with a weaker recommendation. So why did the guidelines reach that conclusion? Because of the studies that have been performed for more than 30 years, we have the CAS study, which tested coronary bypass in patients with LV dysfunction. We see that survival was significantly better with bypass surgery compared to medical therapy, and the benefit was more pronounced in those patients with poor ejection fraction. The sicker patients benefit the most. So do we have head-to-head -head trials comparing PCI and bypass in patients with chronic heart failure? We have one retrospective non-randomized comparison between multivessel stenting and bypass graft and there was no significant difference, but keep in mind, this is not a randomized prospective trial. There were more myocardial infarction with PCI, more repeat revascularization with PCI, but there were more strokes with bypass, and this is commonly noticed in all trials comparing PCI and coronary bypass. But if we look to meta-analysis of trials in ischemic cardiomyopathy comparing bypass and PCI, we find a landslide victory for coronary bypass across all domains. Bypass is better than medical treatment and PCI in mortality, in myocardial infarction, in cardiac death, and in repeat revascularization. So why does bypass win in patients with heart failure? It's probably because bypass results in neutralization of a long segment of disease. If low limiting lesion, is neutralized, as well as any future non-flow limiting lesions that have the potential to rupture in the future and cause outcomes. Bypass them is a guarantee for a better long-term future, whereas PCI by default is a focal therapy only for the flow limiting lesion. But there are other non-flow limiting lesions that can rupture in the future resulting in events and they are not protected. So from the literature, the answer for the three questions is Yes, revascularization improves outcome in heart failure. Viability assessment, no, but you can still do it if you will adhere to the results. Bypass or PCI, bypass is a clear winner. But what happens in real life? Reality is different from literature. In real life, we need to consider the patient's values, comorbidities, the local available resources, and the best evidence, of course. And this is a simple diagram which gives us a rough idea on where to go. Patients with severe mitral regurgitation, triple vessel disease, left main disease, with few comorbidities, more severe LV dysfunction, they should better go for complete revascularization with bypass surgery, most likely. Whereas those patients with less viable myocardial, elderly, with multiple comorbidities, single vessel disease, then probably medical therapy would be sufficient. And if you want a clear algorithm, I found this nice algorithm from a nice review published in the Journal of the American Heart Association, and it takes into account a very important variable in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, which is angina. If patients with heart failure present with angina, then they would probably end up revascularizing them, especially if they have significant inducible ischemia. If they present with angina and there's no significant inducible ischemia, then we consider them in a heart team evaluation bypass if they are low surgical risk or angioplasty in case of refractory symptoms. Patients with heart failure who do not have angina, then here viability assessment would make sense. If they have significant hibernating myocardium, more than 7% of the MV mass by positron emission tomography or CMR, if they have significant viable myocardium, then bypass would make sense. If there's no significant viable myocardium, then we still refer them to the heart team. Consider bypass if they have low surgical risk and consider PCI if they are high surgical risk. So I hope that I answered the three questions and this would be a helpful guide when you're seeing the next patient with heart failure. Thank you so much and see you in the coming episode. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button, share, and leave a comment. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update. Thanks for your support. See you all soon.